From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast about the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. You, you, can't, you can't be necessarily expert in everything. And, and also, even if you, you will be, I mean, it will be very costly because there are elements that are much more focused for example, on design or modeling and simulation, or you know, just the material, and and you know, if these elements work together, you know, and work together seamlessly with the right manner and the right you know uh, flow of the information, um, that the outcome would be uh, much much more impressive. And I think to shorten uh, all the um, time and reduce the cost associated uh, for the developments. As Barang Porganji. Bring is the VP of Materials Technology at Morph3D. He holds a PhD in Metallurgy and Materials Processing from Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. And he spent his career working in Advanced Metallic Materials Processing. He's worked as a senior advisor and consultant in helping to drive the adoption of AM in both domestic and international markets. Before Morph3D, he served as a professor and director of additive manufacturing at the University of Toledo. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Ryan, thanks so much for joining the show today. Um, excited about uh, a materials discussion today and hearing more about kind of your own career. But uh, I like to start with all my guests, kind of getting down to kind of the fundamentals, so to speak. Um, where where did you grow up? Kind of what got you on the path towards engineering and additive manufacturing? So kind of what do those early days look like? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for having me. And I would like to say hi to your audience first. Yeah, I was grew up in Iran, and uh, and I did my bachelor and master degree at the University of Tehran in Iran, and I did metallurgy materials engineering. Uh, and I should say that you know when when I started metallurgy, I had very much no idea. <laughs> okay, about you know what would be what it look like, you know. Uh, so culturally, we were kind of, you know, yeah, you're good in uh, math, uh, physics, you know, chemistry, you probably should be an engineer, or you want to become a doctor, you know, and usually the pass, you know, for you, um, you know, to get education and, and pretty much, you know, grow it would be, you know, going to school, go to schools, like University of Tehran is one of, I would say, the best, if not the best. Uh, so yeah, I... Um, I, I, I started metallurgy and materials engineering and materials science, and I just, you know, really, really found that, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. This, um, fascinated by, you know, everyday learning. Was it the hands-on part of it? Like, what, what was it, like, what was the kind of spark that, that kind of got you hooked in? Was there a particular thing you liked learning about or a particular yeah. industry or well, something? Well, the first... Like yeah, well, the first thing that I really liked, you know, I think the first the first class that we had was like a crystallography and, and understanding the crystal structure of the materials, right? And all the symmetries and how these are, you know, just forming metals or, you know, uh, getting into different, um, you know, symmetrical categories, kind of like a physics of the crystals, and then all of a sudden getting also to the uh, physical metallurgy and the mechanical metallurgy, understanding and you know, all about, you know, dislocations and also, you know, how the thermodynamics and kinetics uh, coming into this. Th those were really, really interesting, you know, things for me. And those are kind of more fundamentals. And then you will see the impact of that in your kind of, you know, real life, you know how you know advanced materials and using the advanced materials and advanced manufacturing processes actually helped building sustainable societies right um, moving you know to the uh, to the technologies that would be pretty much like impossible if you didn't have a right material if you didn't have a right material manufacturing uh, combination together right so those were uh, I would say uh, adding more and more to driving force of learning. And what, when you started kind of your looking at metallurgy and doing material science, did you have a career path in mind that you were 
were you academic path? Were you looking at industry? Were you looking at any specific yeah. type of uh, track as you as you yeah, started? Is, or did that kind of yeah. grow organically? Yeah, no, this is this is interesting. You know, I probably you know uh, uh, I have I have told some of my close friends this, but this is this is kind of like the first time. Uh, probably a lot of people will actually learn about it. It's breaking uh, news. In your, in breaking news. <laughs> We're gonna need the camera yeah, so, on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, my idea was getting my engineering degree and go to work. Right, uh, no, no, really, you know, driving force for getting PhD or getting into you know even academia. Right. Uh, so I think it was the third year of my uh, my undergrad and I went to do intern, okay? And that was a, uh, that was a, a car company and I went to the casting uh, house of that car company uh, to do my intern. I, I, I made the right, wrong decision, okay? So because I, I had the capability to go to more kind of an engineering, clean you know, work for the internship. I went to the, the most dirtiest part of, of the company and that three months was so hard for me. Okay, when I finished that, I said, okay, I want to go to the PhD because I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to become an engineer working in these shops. Okay, um, and and this is real. That was that was the that was the first thing I said. Okay, well, no, uh, I should continue. And and again, as as I learn more and more about uh, materials and uh, and uh, and how it impacts and how actually. The material science in metallurgy uh, is is a field that never ends, right? It actually adds uh, to my curiosity and it adds to kind of a driving force. Okay, I need to learn more. I need to do more research, and I really like doing research. So uh, I went to the uh, to the grad school, and for the grad school, I went to Japan. As, as you know, I went to Tohoku University in Japan. Again, one of the I, I would say one of the best metallurgy schools in the world. So uh, yeah, I had a chance to basically see a different culture, see a different, you know, uh, obviously way of working and in and, and learning. And what was it like in in Japan? Was there a language? Was what were classes taught? Was it were they taught in Japanese? Did you have to learn Japanese? And, uh, to... Yeah, yeah, no, not 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 necessarily for getting your PhD uh, okay. because my courses were all in English, and I think in uh, in universities, especially this university like Tohoku, you know, you could pretty much communicate in English with your professor and with your lab mates. I mean, there were no issues, and thesis were all in English, even students at Tohoku University, like Japanese student, had to present their thesis in English. So there were there were no language barrier, let's say, you know, from the university standpoint, but obviously you have to learn, you know, the basics, at least to be able to communicate and live, you know, that, yeah. And I didn't know anything about Japanese, like not a single word, probably one or two words, you know, like say hi, goodbye, something like uh -huh. that. And yeah, I mean, it, it was a challenge, but it was an, uh, I would say, exciting and interesting challenge. What was the biggest takeaway that you had over your time there? Uh, well, there, there are se several things that I can point out, but I think the, the biggest one was the add kind of a flexibility, uh, kind of, you know, I would say mind elasticity, right? That, hey, you know, people are not all similar people are different you know you have to respect a lot of different things to be able to work with people that are not look like you that are not thinking like you that don't have similar backgrounds right uh, we had like an uh, international students from different cultures different backgrounds you know all working in kind of a japanese style right with uh, japanese professors yeah so uh yeah i think that was that was the I would say most important takeaway uh, for those many years that I spent in Japan. Yeah, and so when when was it during this time that you got uh, any exposure to added manufacturing? When was kind of that thread of your career started? No, not in Japan. <laughs> no, that was that was not yet the time. You know, uh, yeah. you're talking about two thousand three, four, or five. Okay. Right? So okay. <laughs> Hey, you're not. You don't look that old. No, come on. <laughs> so. Thank you. I, I take it as a compliment, right? <laughs> so, yeah. My my first exposure to heavy manufacturing was at the University of Waterloo uh, when I was a postdoc, and yeah. uh, and then you know at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I remember, you know, there was um, there was a gentleman from GE, which I, I don't remember the name now. Came and did a seminar on powder bed fusion. 
and you know all this powder um you know technology and um and yeah i i started doing kind of uh again the basics of metallurgy uh around additive manufacturing uh in that time frame and that was uh that was exposure in getting into you know uh the additive really uh and and the processes and uh Getting very close to the community has really started when I was uh, working as a program manager at a manufacturing program manager for Eaton. Mm -hmm. Many folks that I talk to in academia and and who make migration to industry, like I'm always curious about how they kind of early on in their career, kind of looking at studying and 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 trying to do their own kind of unique research. Like, how do they? get that initial spark for kind of the direction that they want to to search so when you were doing your postdoc and um and everything afterwards kind of what direction were you kind of floating in in, in the met realm of metallurgy sure yeah and uh, i i think it has a couple of different facets if you want to answer this question uh there are some, I would say, part of the technology, a part of you know your research that you you know you really start uh, forming a bond with, right? You really like that. You see a lot of value yourself, and and you really want to push the boundaries. Let's say you know in that area. Uh, so if you're lucky, uh, that area is the area that is very hot today, right? Meaning that the industry wants it. You know, there's a lot of funding available. You know, there's a lot of you know. A demand out there, uh, especially for engineering, uh, and well, you you basically will have a chance to get funds, you know, from different you know funding agencies, uh, you know, present your work uh, and and be able actually to make connection, you know, with different uh, organizations, right? Uh, so I was uh, I was mainly focused on developing the relationship between microstructural, uh, you know, aspects in how the material behaves. And, and, and for that, you have to be able to basically manipulate or engineer your microstructure. And the engineering of microstructure is pretty much like, you know, the manufacturing methodologies and how do you, how do you manufacture your metal, right? Uh, and parts, uh, obviously, through a thermal uh, mechanical or thermomechanical processes. So you'll be able to basically go and manipulate microstructure, having different microstructure, develop a relationship of microstructure and the material properties, and then imply that uh, at the part level. So this this was my this was my I would say you know uh, academic path, and I, I saw a lot of value. Um, I became you know familiar with using you know neural network uh, during my PhD to actually uh, help. Uh, and especially material development and alloy design and development and microstructural characterization, uh, you know, part of filling into or, you know, adding into the algorithm uh, to be able to predict uh, uh, guess, uh, you know, behavior from the microstructural characterization inputs. And, um, and I think the area that uh, I saw that would be a value uh, was really lightweight and in energy saving. Uh, I think we talk about now, you know, 2008, 9, 10, 11 ish. There was, there was, you know, again, a lot of uh, talk and discussion about, you know, better materials, light weighting, you know, how we can, how we can, you know, save uh, more energy, right? And and once I, I become more and more familiar with additive manufacturing, right, and see that, hey, you know, that additive manufacturing also is a tool that, you know, there's a lot of microstructural features. You know, there's a lot of thermal, uh, thermal mechanical processes involved in additive manufacturing. And there's, this is a tool so you can do a light weighting and incorporating design, incorporating materials, and incorporating process. Now to make something very unique. So that really, again, uh, I would say made me very much, uh, I would say, uh, you know, focused on additive. And of course, obviously, there was a lot of funding. There was a lot of, I would say, wave, uh, right? Everybody now talk about additive manufacturing, and and you just continue, right? You continue uh, with the wave, but you enjoy. I mean, that's that's something is you know, I. It's, it's sometimes you continue and you go with the wave and you continue basically adding, but you don't necessarily enjoy. But I was really enjoying because you know all the fundamentals that I have learned through the years. 
right? I would see that the value of them. I would see how I can use those. I would see, you know, how impactful these are, especially, you know, in, in, in the field of additive that there was obviously some, some lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, especially on the material side. And with your looking at kind of really the fundamentals of microstructure and the material science of, of the, the materials themselves, the parts, and ultimately the process, were there particular industries that you were really drawn more to in terms of applications? I mean, you mentioned light weighting and, and some of the other uh, opportunities, but um, not all industries have kind of the R&D budgets necessarily to go that deep or look at new alloys and things like that. But were there specific industries that you were interested in or, or you were working on during that time period? Yeah, so I started uh, really with the automotive industries and uh, and then working in projects that were related to automotive industries. Uh, you know, from 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 time in Japan and in actually kind of transitioned into energy, uh, and and finally into aviation and aerospace. And and you know, I see I see that these kind of industries like you know these 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 three industries I would say are probably you know. The driving force for you know energy saving, driving force for advanced technologies, driving force for you know there's a, there's a ton of demand and they have the capability and they have a need, right? They have they have a lot of need to be better, to be more effective, uh, you know, for cost saving, energy saving, material saving, sustainability. So they have to spend, and that's that's the area that probably again you see a lot of um, you know folks in academia will focus as well. Well, to address the challenges or potential challenges of, of these industries. And I haven't, I, I really haven't spent much time outside of the additive space, but it, it, it also seems that over the last kind of 10 years, especially, a lot of these challenges that from a material side and even the process side require the collaboration between the end users, between the materials manufacturer, academia in many cases, as well as the machine manufacturer, because all of this is kind of, we're all learning as we go, we're trying to form, fit some of these applications into the right machines and right technologies. And and um, how have you seen kind of the industry evolve along that front in terms of kind of you, you're in it, kind of on the industry side now, but you spent a lot of time in academia, kind of how is how have those relationships been, been evolving over the last few years? Yeah, I think it's evolving in a in a right direction. Uh, may, maybe uh, you know, I, I like to see in a in a in a higher rate, right? That kind of evolves, right? But but uh, there are there are consortiums and uh, in and groups that are formed uh, with the with the universities and and industry, you know, partnering together, and and I think everyone now kind of realizing what you just said about you need to have an ecosystem to address the challenges of, uh, of this technology. It's not just about the machine. It's not just about the process, not just about design, not just about material. Uh, you have to have pretty much like everyone in the room. Now you need to have an application. I think that is the most important thing. You know, you need to have a right application in mind. Uh, and the right application is really coming from a need. You know, what kind of need? Uh, do we have right now and what are the challenges we are facing we're probably facing a challenge of you know much better thermal management we're probably you know facing a challenge of higher higher temperature applications right uh, getting into hypersonics and things like that uh, we are uh, facing challenges of how we can do much more you know light weighting right so yeah, there there is if you if you look at from different angles, you know, coming from like a mechanical engineer, industrial engineer, process folks, you know, manufacturing, material. I mean, everyone has kind of a solution based on their background, right? But you just say material, oh well, you, you know, yeah, higher temperature. So we go with the high temperature materials that are available. You know, you just look at your you know Ashby chart and diagram and see that you know what material. But but that's that's very narrow thinking. And usually it end up not being successful because you know it's again ecosystem. You have to look at the design. You have to have uh, manufacturability. You need the right machines for that. And you know, process development. Okay, where do you actually go and source the material, right? And a lot of things in the material development. We are dealing with kind of old school materials. Still, we are dealing with old school materials. I, you know, I was saying this. You know, 
five, six, seven years ago, we still we're still in the same place, right? We have uh, moved forward, but also the majority of the materials in development not for additive manufacturing. They're considering the AM, uh, especially in powder bed and the, the you know requirements and boundary conditions. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of good movements uh, with all these consortiums that has been developed again in, in the US mainly, but also in Europe and other part of the world. Yeah, and what ultimately made you make the jump from academia to kind of maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing now in, in industry? Yeah, uh, two, two things. And, you know, I'm saying this very, I mean, uh, clear. One, uh, again, talking, talking to industry folks to, to be able to get funding, you know, to continue. I realized that, you know, I, I, I don't really understand their language, right? <laughs> so most of the time, uh, you know, things that they are, you know, bringing up and talking about is not exactly things that are, you know, translating right in, into my understandings, right? And, and, and you know, I, I felt that there is a gap here. And, and the second, you know, uh, was, you know, in, in the entire family situation, everything that I had, I found this that I can, I can make probably, you know, more, uh, and I can support my family much more, you know, going to industry, especially at the time that I make that decision versus, you know, staying in academia. And, and then I did that. And uh, I think the first two, three months proved that, yes, I don't understand the language. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a learning curve, really understanding, you know, the terminology is how you look at a project, how you actually put it. But uh, Again, I think because of the fundamentals and because I really enjoyed it and because I think I joined a very good company, uh, Eaton, and everything uh, that they basically provided as a tool, uh, that kind of a learning curve was very steep and very short, so. Nice. Yeah. And and so, I mean, maybe fast forward a little bit. So like, so you, you're at Eat, you were at Eaton for a while and maybe kind of go to present day yeah, in terms of what, yeah. what, what, you're, what are you doing now and, and kind of what are some of the exciting directions that, that your company is taking? Yeah, so yeah, uh, I worked for Eaton, joined GE, and you know, now Morph 3D. And basically, you know, I'm sure that you and your audience are very much familiar with Morph 3D, that we are a company that, you know, supporting uh, aerospace, aviation, and defense industry. Uh, so we're making parts and making solutions for these industries. And, and as we all know, uh, for these industries and for additive manufacturing, there is still a lot of challenges needs to be addressed with respect to materials and materials technologies, right? So basically, uh, part of uh, my mission and the team's mission here is developing, again, right infrastructure from the material standpoint to be able to address those challenges for industry and to be actually at the forefront of, uh, of uh, providing services and solution for that industry. So part of uh, a complete solution would be always materials and, and material solutions. So we're developing that uh, capabilities and infrastructure, uh, again, internally through the partnerships, uh, through developing the right ecosystem, uh, and more of 3D to be able to address industry challenges and to add value and what do you so going back we talked a, you, you mentioned a little bit in kind of the the previous question about consortium and collaboration but maybe dive into a little bit more about what you mean by ecosystem in terms of added manufacturing and and what you're doing at morph so what does that mean in in your mind and and maybe share that with the audience sure so what what i'm talking about the ecosystem it, it really starts with okay you have an idea right you have a you have a product in in mind that that product supposedly solve a problem so really you know you have a challenge right you own a product now you want to manufacture that and you think that additive manufacturing is a right process to manufacture it right okay so what what do you need you need to find the right machine you need to find the right material then you need to have you know those processes you need to be able to test it and certify it or qualify it uh, qualify it and certify it and, and use it right and make sure that you can sell it to your customers right now all these elements are actually need to work together uh, to to form that right ecosystem 
And obviously, there is there is no you, you can't have just one company say that you know uh, you know I have everything under one roof. You know, uh, probably there are some big companies that they have most of the elements, right? But uh, but you, you can't you can't be necessarily expert in everything. And and also if, even if you you will be, I mean, it will be very costly because there are elements that are much more focused. For example, on design or modeling and simulation, or you know, just the material. And and you know, if these elements work together, you know, and work together seamlessly with the right manner and the right you know uh, flow of the information, um, that the outcome would be uh, much much more impressive. And I think shorten uh, all the um, time and reduce the cost associated uh, for the developments. So this is the idea that we try actually to implement: bringing right players who are expert, for example, in precision, who are expert in uh, vision are experts in control, or experts in machine design, or experts in uh, software, all together, experts in material, experts in post-process, in solve uh, for a industry problem. And industry problems um, are, again, like we, we're not talking about necessarily, you know, making one part here and there, right? So as I said, you know, the industry problems, what are, what are the industry challenges today? And that's where I think through our connection, established connection through the years of Morph 3D, uh, we have a good understanding because we're you know, really talking every day with our customers, you know, the folks who are really, really, you know, uh, pushing this industry and uh, at the forefront. So we understand the challenges, as I told you, you know, uh, case of hypersonics, in case of you know, thermal management, in case of thermal machineries, you know, there, there, are, there are known challenges. And, uh, and I think everyone has a piece of the solution. What we try to do is basically bringing all those, you know, together and form a right ecosystem that can address, can add value. Uh, so in a way that's reducing the time for the development and the cost for development. I think that should be the goal. Otherwise, you know, yeah, we can solve most of the, you know, the challenges, uh, but we can't necessarily solve those economically viable. So to solve those economically viable, we need to have these partnerships in place and to build the ecosystem. And it sounds like nice symmetry with your within your own career because you had we're on kind of sort of that side in the academic early years. Then you kind of learned how to speak the language, so to speak, as as you mentioned and. In, at Eaton yes. and, and GE, and now you've got kind of the uh, kind of back in that space of kind of solving these industry problems at, at Morph 3D. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And so I've got kind of a, a, a few minutes left. Um, I've got just maybe two or three additional questions, um, hopefully short. Um, <laughs> but the first one is um, kind of as we kind of get into the Q4 of, of 20. 22 kind of what are you excited about from kind of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis as, as well as just industry-wide or what you're doing kind of as a company yeah i think the, as, a, as a company again we are we are in a transition right so uh, so transition from like a smaller company kind of in startup mode now you know with the uh nikon investment and acquisition now you know uh, coming to a new facility and expanding and expanding, uh, you know, uh, pretty quickly, I would say. Uh, so there are a lot of excitement at the same time, a lot of challenges that we actually, you know, uh, engage in an everyday, you know, serving our customers, serving, you know, our partners. So there's, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, and in industry, I, I see a lot of, you know, evolving in industry, you know, uh, mergers, acquisitions, you know, announcements, advanced technologies, new technologies, you know, coming. Uh, and there is something that, again, uh, caught my eye is there is there is there is a less of a hype in industry in our industry now uh, compared to, you know, a few years back and more kind of a realization. And now we are more talking about, you know, how we can how we can more and more industrialize it, how we can more and more getting into scale, how we can more and more solve, you know, the equality issues, uh, getting into the right qualification manner, things like that, rather than, you know, hey, this is the next big thing is coming in and, and prematurely, you know, announcing those things. So, yeah, I think that's, that's really excited me. I think uh, a level of maturity in our industry is in a good, I would say, you know, level. 
Fantastic. And so last question, a little bit more lighthearted in terms of helping to educate the, the audience a little bit. Um, what uh, What's a book you'd recommend or somewhere where you you'd kind of something you've, you've learned over the last few years or kind of a favorite uh, piece of literature or, or, uh, uh, or writing that has influenced kind of what you do in your career? Yeah. So, uh, there's several one. I mean, for the for the one that want to get into agri manufacturing, there's a there's a book that you know our colleague at NASA, Paul Credo, actually uh, he wrote uh, with the help of you know other uh, you know his colleagues. I think I recommend that to everyone you know want to get you know kind of a condensed everything version of agri manufacturing. I think that's that's really helpful. There are, there are many uh, I would say papers out there uh, that that can uh, can be very helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I read a book uh, when I was much younger, and the name was uh, Heisenberg probably slept here. Uh, <laughs> that was that was definitely a very good book for me. I mean, kind of giving me a, a perspective of you know uh, different physicists and how how basically you know uh, things in the, in the world of physics evolved um, with a, with a very good and nice language. I I recommend that you know to uh, much young you know. Uh, kind of audience to to get to that. Uh, yeah, I mean there there are so many uh, I would say educational materials now out there that are not necessarily any more books, you know. Uh, <laughs> like what we're doing now, right? <laughs> Yeah, seriously, exactly. Searching in YouTube, and 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 my son actually educated me in that. Yeah. So because I mean in in their kind of I would say generation they face a challenge. It's not like us, we were actually going to library or we had to spend a lot of, you know, steps just to get one paper. You know, we had to submit our request to a librarian and then we go and print, uh, you know, a, a paper and then we'll read it. They just Google it or just put it in YouTube and see how, how there would be someone in YouTube or in Google actually explain them how you solve that problem. Uh, I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I have to yeah, in that direction. Sounds great. Well, we really appreciate your, your time today, sharing kind of your career and, and all that you've done to advance the material science forward and metallurgy forward in, in this industry. And so uh, looking forward to seeing you in person one of these days soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate it. And I'm really, you know, uh, enjoying seeing you know, how you are contributing into uh, developing the next gen uh, you know, technical and experts and folks that are learn about ID manufacturing, educated about man ID manufacturing. Uh, this is this is really really nice, and thank you for everything that you do. Okay.